Hello guys, how are you all doing today? So today we're going to do the Mythbuster video 10. So a lot of people have requested me to do uh, the species, the Brachypalma abaltosum, the Honduras curly hair. So without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so the common name of uh, the species here is the Honduras curly hair. Or that's more specifically uh, because most of these specimens originate from the Honduras region. So it's kind of a unique Brachypalma because most of the Brachypalma species do come from uh, Mexico. But a lot of people just like to simplify themselves and call it curly hair. So the Latin name of the species is Brachypalma abapulosum. So it's a pretty uh, simple uh, Latin name to pronounce. Just so you know that the H is silent, so we call it Brachypalma abapulosum. Okay, now for the cost and the availability of the specimens. So uh, the cost for a Brachypalma for this one in particular is pretty cheap. Uh, you could get an adult female for probably uh, around less than a hundred dollars, probably fifty to eighty, depending on who's selling it. Uh, slings, I know in Canada these are one of the cheaper ones. Uh, for quarter inch, they cost around five to ten dollars. So the availability, you'll mostly find them in online dealers. Pet stores rarely uh, attain them unless uh, you go to a pet store and try to order one specifically if they can get them. Now for the size and lifespan for the species. Well, it's a normal typical size for a Brachypalma that you would expect. Uh, they get around having a six inch leg span. So uh, here is an adult female. This is my oldest living tarantula that I have in my collection. She's Curly Sue. She is a 23-year-old female curly hair. So this is what she looks like. It's a brown tarantula, but you can note the curly hairs on the legs. So these are one of the tarantulas that have a permanent bad hair day, as the lady like to call it in the hobby. And I'll show you my other one. And here's my other one. This is uh, Kira. And you could note the curly hairs, especially on the legs. It's an awesome specimen. Now, now about the lifespan of this uh, Brachypalma bopulosum. Well, it's typical of most of the Brachypalma species. Uh, they take around five to seven years to fully mature out. Uh, males will probably live a year after they mature, so. I would estimate anywhere between five to eight years. Females are a lot longer lived. Uh, they have a huge lifespan of 25 to 30 years. Well, you do have living proof of this one. She's 23 years old. I got her ever since I started collecting as a young 12 year old and 16 years, she's still alive. I got her as an adult back then and still alive and kicking strong. So mature males of the specimens uh, will uh, look exactly like females, except you would expect them to look like a mature male. They would have tibial hooks on their first pair of legs, and then they would have bulbous uh, pulps, as all mature males do. Now about the enclosure setup and the care sheet video of the specimen. Well, I opened up a can of worms on the on that discussion so I guess I'll like to clarify myself because I didn't really choose my words correctly but and anyways uh, enclosure setup uh, it's five gallon as you see right here is just more than enough for a, an adult female and for juveniles I tend to house them in delicate containers and small slings I use uh, pill vials like you saw uh, for this uh, e rufescens, it's pretty much how I house my three quarter inch one. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that one. So if you remember Kira, she was about three quarters of an inch uh, when I got her during the March uh, 2010 expo. She was a three quarter of an inch, now she's around two inches and it's January 15th, 2011. So. They're remarkably a little faster growing than most of the Brachypelmas. 
The fastest growing Brachypelma that I know of is the uh, bee wagons, which we'll uh, eventually do in his best video on those species. So now to discuss the can of worms that I opened up during the last uh, Mythbuster video about the enclosure setups and I kind of didn't really choose my words correctly to explain it so probably if I explain it using a different perspective maybe you can understand where I'm coming from. So one of the users was kind of upset with me because I made a ridiculous statement saying that uh, I didn't take into account that tarantulas are wild animals and in nature they do have a large jungle, rainforests, and desert scrublands to share with other animals, which is obviously very true. Even if you breed tarantulas in captivity, they are still wild animals. They're not domesticated like dogs, cats, and birds and rats. Okay, so hopefully, uh, if I do this under a different perspective, you'll probably understand maybe where I'm coming from. And probably many of others will uh, agree with me, uh, such as uh, Jonathan W. and Bushka films. So it all amounts to their eyesight. So if you can appreciate more, most of the wild animals have very good eyesight. Tarantulas very don't have that great of eyesight. They are myopic, which means that they're nearsighted. So if you look on a carapace on a tarantula to the naked eye, you'll probably see that there are two big eyes. But if you look with a really great microscope you'll see that you'll see many of their eyes clustered together so most tarantulas have eight eyes uh, some of the members of the Samapoa species have six of them so because of this eye arrangement they're myopic so they're partially blind they're nearsighted so they what that means is that they could see a few centimeters of what's close to them but they can all, not always see what's far for them. So let's say probably around the size of this pink chalk is what is visible to a tarantula. So anything bigger, let's say bigger than this uh, black chalkboard, uh, it probably cannot see probably up to this this distance right here. So when tarantulas are in nature they do tend to burrow so that way they don't feel as exposed so that means that's that's what I meant by overwhelming is that if a T is exposed to like predators like Bushka film says chances are they might be somewhat stressed so and also they really don't venture far from their burrows once they establish it so hopefully uh, that clarifies uh, what I, what I should have been said earlier and hopefully you could see it in a different light. Anyways, now going back to uh, the Mythbuster video, we still have uh, the remaining four topics left to cover. So uh, recommendations, I'll then I'll scrap temperament after, I do recommend this to a beginner tarantula owner. Uh, as I said earlier, they are very cheap and very affordable and uh, they're a great addition and they're, they're a must have. Now, temperament of these uh, species, again, they range from uh, personality to personality. As you know, each T reacts in a different manner. So, in general, most of the Brachypelma abopolosums are fairly docile, which means they could tolerate a lot of uh, disturbances before they will actually bite. Some of them can be a little aggressive than most, but it's very rare that you be able to see a defensive uh, B. abopolosum. So people wanted me to suggest if uh, these are good handling spiders. I certainly do recommend them uh, for handling, but as I said, when you do handle tarantulas, you do have risks involved, you know, you being bitten by the spider. Just because the tarantula is docile doesn't mean that it doesn't bite. And you also put a danger to the spider, is that if he bites you and you drop it, you risk admin ruptures. So this is probably why I don't handle many of my specimens, just because for the safety reasons of this tarantula. And they really don't benefit from extra handling. Um, some of them might be get even more agitated by excess handling, I know for a fact that Charlotte was uh, really 
got more aggressive every time I handled her, so that's why I don't handle her anymore. But Kira, as you saw during the 1000th video I uploaded, which was ages ago, uh, as you can see, very friendly T, and uh, yeah. Okay, breeding. Breeding should be fairly easy with the species. It's not like one of the uh, red brachypalmas like the Emilia, uh, Bomi, or Smithy. These are relatively easier to breed, and I believe that they get around 300 to 500 babies, if I'm not mistaken. I really don't have any mature males of uh, brachypalmas to mate with, so my information uh, could be a little mistaken. But this is what I would assume to be. So overall review, a great tea to own. Sure, it may not be the most colorful of the brachypalmas, but these are by far one of the cheapest ones that you could afford. Uh, these are recommended for any beginner that wants to um, collect teas. I personally recommend Biobopolosum over a rose hair because of their um, predictable nature. You know that these are brachypalmas are voracious uh, appetite eaters. Uh, they will take readily prey, unlike G. rosea that does refuse uh, food from time to time. Um, they're not to particularly very moody tarantulas, so just give you an idea of of her, I'll just prod her, I'll prod the abdomen just to see the temperament. I don't know, that's pretty docile. Well, mine, well, this one actually is slightly more skittish as juveniles, but adults will tend to mellow out, so I'll just even poke her with her by the hand. As you can see, she's really docile. So uh, that's the Mythbuster video of the Brachypama abopulosum. So I do hope you enjoyed it. So now I'm going to start going into alphabetical order. So you'll have the available list on my channel page of which ones I'll do. So the ones I'm going to be doing uh, next time is the Acanthus scurrius species. So I'll be covering uh, the Brockle Hursty and uh, Geniculata and specifically then I'll move on to the A. Simani and the A. Calcotes. So I hope this uh, video is enjoyable and hope you like it. Alright thanks guys.